was a good break, huh? I guess we'll start back in 1 Peter 3, 1. Let's open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are um, just thankful to be here. Uh, we know that your plan continues to move forward. And we know that uh, you're always waiting on us to jump on board. And we just pray that we can continue to learn, continue to grow, and continue to grow in this love relationship with you because we know that is the only thing that benefits us to the maximum and we just thank you for that opportunity we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name amen so let me read uh, 1 Peter 3 1 one more time because uh, that, remember this verse applies to the to the wife who uh, was dedicated in the Lord to the Lord and she uh, had a husband who was not so dedicated to the Lord. And there's actually, you know, we, you get caught up in that sometimes and it feels like a waste of time sometimes, but it's not because this verse is saying just the other, other way. It says, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So it's interesting. Um, I wanted to start off by looking at this word one, because this is what you're doing, right? This is, uh, and you know, in a, in, a, in a certain way, this, I think this applies to the man. It can apply to the man as well. If, if he has a wife that is not uh, necessarily on board with the word, uh, this word I think applies. This is what it means. Well. Thought I had, yeah, there we go. It, the word is cardino, and it, it's a verb, and future passive indicative, and it means to acquire by effort or investment, to gain. Isn't that interesting? Because sometimes, you know, we think what you're doing goes without notice, or even, you know, many people get frustrated Think about what a waste of time there is, you know, what they're in involved with and when it comes to your spouse, but not according to this word. This is something, an investment is something that um, to be worth anything, it takes time. It takes a little bit of time to invest. It's a slow process and it happens gradually over time. So what happens is in that relationship, not by what you say, but it's by what you do. And this can apply to your kids as well because they see, they can see, even though they may not listen, it goes, whoosh, whoosh, and it seems to just float right out the other way, but they can see. And they can see what this, how this word, I think a word applies to them as well. It's an investment. It's an investment. We spend time in the word so we can live it in our lives, so we can think it. And when someone sees that, and when they take note of it, that counts as an investment. You have invested in that person towards them getting them towards getting closer to the word, maybe, or a stronger uh, desire to see, hey, what, how are they living that way? What are they, how are they thinking? How are they able to pass test this adversity that everybody else is, seems to be crumbling under? So that's the investment we're talking about. Um, and it's interesting that this word is in the future, passive indicative, which is saying that the gain or the investment is received by the subject, which in this case is the husband. That's the gain here. It's received by the, the subject. So, um, and you know that nothing that is divinely invested in returns null and void. Is there a verse on that? The word of God never returns null and void, right? So future indicative means that your investment is a reality when you are placing the Lord first in your life in obedience. To and it means to conduct, expressed, expressed according to certain principles, a way of life. This is living your life according to God's word. So, and this applies to the husband as well making an investment when it comes to the wife who is negative to God's word or anyone who is negative to God's word. So 
The other reason I know you are not wasting your investment is because of what verse 2 says. It says, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, they are, well, look at the word, to pay close attention to, watch, to observe. This is what happens. This is a result of just being around someone in general. Whether they listen or don't listen is not even the issue. Whether they're against or for what you stand for is not the issue here. The issue is that they see. They can see and they can pick up and they, they pay close attention to. They'll never tell you that, but that's what happens. When we're around people, we notice things. We notice their mannerisms. We notice how they think. We notice you know, what people they associate with. We notice how they communicate. We notice things that a lot more than you may think you notice, but you notice a lot. And in this case, the negative person or the person that is not in tune with the Lord is paying very close attention. They're paying close attention. So even though you may think otherwise, which sometimes we do, you know, it's easy to see. Um, or it's easy to get kind of in that rut when you think all this is just a big waste of time. But they see how you live and how you think. Because you have to remember that even though the husband and the wife may not be like minded when it comes to God's word, the spouse who is faithful here has a tremendous opportunity to influence the other spouse. Tremendous. Because there's a lot of times when we get involved with the spouse where we aren't even tuned in to this like mindedness that we should have when we marry a spouse. Well, guess what? This verse indicates that there's hope. There's always hope, right? God provides hope in all opportunities for us in every circumstance we're in. But it just goes to show you that there's, a, there's an investment. You've got to put the time in when it comes in your relationship with the Lord. And you've got to win. You've got to win them over. And that investment comes through your behavior, your lifestyle. Big deal. It's a big deal. So... I mean, when you think about it, it makes sense because you see these people every day. So you don't have to make this a great, huge effort uh, because they can see how you live. This becomes part of your life. You know, I go back to to kids um, every day. You know, you can teach them and teach them and teach them. They may hear some of it. They may not hear other things. But they see you every day and they think about things that you have no idea that they're thinking about, about what we do, how we talk to our spouses, how we associate with other people. That's a lifestyle. See, this isn't something that happens that they pick up in a one time conversation. This is over over time that happens and they pick up on these things. So. The verse that says they observe your chaste. This is a word agnos. Agnos. It's H-A-G-N-O-S. And it means holiness. They observe your experiential sanctification of living the spiritual way of life. That's what they're observing. They're observing your application of the word. If we can live a life of as Christians, that's what we are doing. We're becoming holy, right? That's the word. The uh, hagios is the word for holiness, the verb. This is agnos. This is just the closest thing you can get to. It's actually hagnos. So you can hear it. It's the noun form or it's an adjective. So they can see, they can see that you're living by God's standards and thinking which is really impossible to do unless you are living in the power of the spirit, by the way. So this is, that's an important piece of this. And notice, and they also see, what's the next word? Well, the NA, NASB translates it respectful behavior. But literally, I don't know if I have a, no. The word literally says in phobos, that's in fear. In the Greek, that's in fear. 
Respectful behavior may be one way to put it, but it's in fear. Didn't we just hear a verse on that? And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. There's a, a, there's a reverence and honor, a respect that comes from your relationship. And that is ex comes out. It comes out in your lifestyle. It, it's how you live. That's a fear. That's a subject. It kind of goes back to what we've been talking to about subjecting ourselves to the plan of God in that humble, humility, uh, mindset, attitude that we can have through God's word. And that's really the most important thing, the impact you can have on anyone. Look at uh, not only that, but we have verses. We had verse 21, then we, have, we, we heard Proverbs 22, 4. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. So there's another one with the fear of the Lord. Um, and, you know, it's kind of hits on what we've been talking about, about that humility. And I know I can't obviously reteach Wednesday's lesson, but as much as I would like to. But uh, I think it's worth looking at this one part again on the divine institutions, because and these are realms of the world that God has designed for our happiness and our preservation and freedom. And remember in each case that we notice there's a, an authority aspect of this that God has designed for each of these for their proper function. And remember that Satan's goal is to remove, to affect, to uh, infiltrate anything that he can do to each one of these. You know he works on your volition all the time in, in, in agreement with your sin nature, which is um, you, the husband, we see that all the time. Uh, husband gets taken out. Uh, the parents is the authority to the children. And in our government nationalism, we have our laws, which you, we see the results of that being taken out uh, by the police, being the authority removed, and you see the results of that. So Satan's working hard. He's working very hard to remove each individual piece of authority because he knows that it works good. And it's God's design and God designed it in such a way because if we follow his design, it works as it's supposed to work. But when you remove one of these, it doesn't work as good or as well as it should. Of course, as you well know, I'm thinking of the parents here. If there is a single parent, God provides. Um, God provides for the children. God provides for the parent. If that parent is in tune with the plan of God, God will provide no matter what. Uh, this is just showing you the aspect of the authority in each specific role as God has designed it. So, and we talked about what happens in each of these cases. I think I went through a few different scenarios and how they kind of malfunction or kind of fall apart in each case. And I wanted to show you a few Old Testament examples of this, this same kind of, you can kind of figure out which one of these are, are being taken out. Or um, most of them, of course, are always include volition, right? The authority of our own volition. Genesis 11.3, how about the Tower of Babel? It says, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone. Notice that they switched. They had a switch there. Instead of something that's hard, solid, and not going to break, they used brick. Came up with their own solution, right? May have been faster, cheaper, maybe better in their own eyes. See that all the time. And they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach in the, into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, what was the result of this? The result is that they got out from under God's authority. And all of a sudden, once you're out from under God's kingdom, you start to want to build your own kingdom. And that's exactly what happened. People will... Once we get out of a certain assumed authority and that humility, 
you start to create your own kingdom. And so that's when they tried to build their own human kingdom, which the Lord didn't appreciate, if you saw in the next, in the next verses, which resulted in what? That's when nationalism came into play right there. That's when the Lord scattered the people. Remember, there was one language. This is when he took them and he scattered them across the world and he created different languages right here, all from the Tower of Babel because everyone thought they were, um, thought they could build a, a city and make it go all the way to heaven almost. So, and then you see another example in Judges 21, 25. I think I have a slide for that. And this applies for us today, doesn't it? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I guess technically it doesn't because we do have a president. But, you know, there may be a day when we don't. But this was a time in Israel when they didn't have a king. And they got to the point where they removed themselves under that relationship, under, out of that authority of God. And guess what they wanted? A human king. All of a sudden they needed a king. They wanted a king because all the other countries had a king. So, you know, we start to look, oh, I need that. That's, that's something I need. Remember, you remove yourself out from the authority. Guess what you start to think about? The things that you think you need. And the only thing that's going to fulfill that is a human solution. So they thought they needed a king. Um, so we see that bad decisions are this result of not recognizing authority. Now, we know that if Israel would have stayed humble and continue to recognize God's authority over them, they wouldn't have gotten to this point um, of wanting something that was not the real solution to their problems. We know that. So they wanted a human king because why? Well, we can see that in 1 Samuel 8, 7. Oh, I didn't give you a slide for that. Let me read it. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they said to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which have gone, which have done, which they have done since the day that I have brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. So they were rejecting God. They were rejecting the, uh, the prophet Samuel's advice to them um, about how to get back. And then, of course, what does Samuel do? He tries to warn them. He tries to, they, they wanted a king. They kept telling Samuel they wanted a king. So he's, he's going to try to look out for him. He tries to warn them, right? Look what he says. He, he's talking to the people, the Jews, the Israelites. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Now, listen what their reaction was. And Samuel talked a lot before this point. I just cut out some verses to show you that Samuel's trying to let them know. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. See how the mind works when you get out from under that authority of God. They thought a king would save the world. How many people, you know, think a new president would save the world? It's looking to that human solution. They've gotten out from the authority of God and they're looking for the human savior to come in and save them. It's tricky. Satan loves to do that, though. He loves to take out that authority. If he can get you off in the boonies, he can get your eyes on that human. He can get your eyes on that human solution because we've, we've gotten out from under that authority. But it's by design. It goes back right to here. It's all working from this right here. Satan's affecting this in every area. He's working on the nation. He's working on the people. He's working on the family, marriage, and he's working on mankind, on your volition. So... Um, so that's these examples just show that when we remove ourselves, uh, we can get into trouble. Easy to do. And this applies to the husband as well. So now we've made it to verse 23. It says, 
For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. So it's kind of almost a, a magnification of the last verse. Of course, there's a little more information here. You see the first word for, it's hati. And this is really giving us a clue as to what is the grounds or the reason for verse 22. Why the subjection to the husband? Well, it's pretty clear the husband is the head of the wife. That for, that word is giving us an uh, indicator of that. The basis of why the previous phrase is true. So, in other words, why God has command. How could God tell you to do such a thing? Well, this verse is telling you why. It's saying, um, for the husband is the head of the wife. But then if we didn't understand that part, God doubles down and gives us something to compare it to. There's that little comparison again, as, as. You know, this, the, the, the level and, and magnitude of this comparison seems over the top. You know, coming from a human perspective about a wife's role to her husband, this is a comparison to Christ as the head of the church. Even I'm telling you this from a human, from myself, this seems to be a, a high priority for you and a responsibility that is very set very high. And of course, I can't say it was an accident. It's here. But this is the kind of priority that you must place when it comes to that position in that role. And that's the as that's that little word that's cluing us into that, that comparison as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being savior of the body. So what we're seeing here, we're seeing the, the physical chain of command. I think we're seeing we could, you know, how you have the structure, you see the chain of command in a company. This is what we're seeing. God is laying us out. You know, we actually have other verses like this that actually are kind of clear when it comes. First Corinthians 11, three is a good one. We can see the same thing. It says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. Here we go. CEO on down. And the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. God, the father. Isn't that interesting? Now, the word understand here means, because it said, I want you to understand. It means to grasp, grasp the meaning of something, to understand, to recognize, to come to know, or to experience. Now, believe it or not, before you can have this change of thought, we've got to understand. We've got to experience. We've got to come to know. You can't just say, do this, as you know. That works for dogs, actually, sometimes. I know it actually takes a little bit of discipline, doesn't it, usually? They don't usually pick up the first time. But you can see here that for the human being, it takes understanding. I guess that is their understanding, right? That hurts, so don't do that, do this. For us, it takes an understanding in the Word, sometimes a little pain, suffering, in God's discipline. But you get the point. We come to know and we understand, and that's, I feel like that's part of my job, right? To see and to give you the necessary information that you can live your life as a rule by. And this is just one of those things that we can see. Of course, this really has everything to do with what? Expectations, expectations. You all have expectations for yourself. You all do. You expect to live how to li how you are to live and God has certain expectations for you as well and those are the things that we need to come in agreement with is what expectations does he have for me specifically what does he want me to understand or become and what does he expect out of the husband as well because this applies to both and this reminded me of the uh, just being on a ship, you know, you, you have a chain of command. A ship won't run without the captain, without the 
petty officers, without the chief petty officers, without the officers, without the captain. It goes top to bottom, right? And when you remove some of these things, when you remove the heads out, things, seems to, things seem to malfunction. And that applies specifically, of course, this is referring to a human understanding, but the word head here in the Greek is kephale. And it's the same word used as Christ is the head of the church. So this is, this is an assignment is what this is telling me. This is saying, this is what you are. You're the head. This is an assignment. We'll consider the husband as the captain. God's the admiral, right? The four star. So, and every ship is ran. You're assigned, every ship you're assigned to is ran by a captain. Each captain has different expectations, whether it be an army command, navy command, marine, whatever. Every boss, every top guy is different. They're human. They have different expectations. They have different integrity. One guy likes a clean ship. One guy doesn't give a crap about how a ship looks, but he cares how you smell. So he wants you clean. Some guys, they have integrity, some don't. It's very different when it comes to commands and captains and how things are run. But it all goes back to that leadership position. When something malfunctions on the ship, when someone does something that's wrong on the ship, you know what, who it's a reflection on? The leader, the captain. If the officers are malfunctioning and not performing as they should out in town, they all go out in town and they make an idiot of themselves, that is a direct reflection back to the command that they're assigned to. It's just like the Christian life, right? We go out and we conduct ourselves in a way that is reflective of who? our relationship with the Lord. Now, when we don't perform in a way that is indicative of this relationship, it reflects, I think it reflects on ourselves because we're not performing as we're, we're not carrying out the word. And it goes back to our responsibility as who we are as Christians. So this is really showing us um, God's, I think, delegated authority and Part of being, you know, in any, any under authority in anything, military, wife, husband, is you have to have humility to carry out the orders to serve in the position. I mean, that, that, that's a legitimate thing, right? You, you've got to be able to have the ability to have the capacity to be able to follow, to be able to follow, which, by the way, is to every single person's advantage. Because from what I've seen, the ability to orient to authority results in many things for uh, anyone. I'm, I'm thinking military, but it results for a better quality of life, more freedom to do more in your own job in areas or in other areas, to be promoted, and the list goes on and on and on. That's in the human realm. Think about this in the marriage perspective. This is what we are to provide the wife. Function, freedom, ability to be promoted, happiness, joy. This is if she's living as in her role under the assigned head, right? It all makes sense, but it's gotta be functioning correctly. Better quality of life. That's just the way the military is designed to work. And that's how a marriage is designed to work as well. Interestingly. So there, there really is a reason why God told Adam not to eat of the fruit from the tree. It's because Adam was the head and responsible for implementing the expectations. Or you could say implementing the policy. We are implementers of the policy. You know, technically, the, you know, you have a relationship, obviously, with the Lord. The, the woman and the man are individually responsible for that relationship. But you can see there's an order. 
of how things go when it comes to your thought process. There's a subjection here, and that's what we're referring to. And that's what I've been trying to get across is there's a reason why God designed it this way. And ultimately, it was a failure on Adam's part for Eve's decision. He can't take credit for her actual decision, but he can take credit for leading up to that point. Right? Falls on the captain. Something goes hairy with the ship. It's because the men didn't know well enough or weren't trained enough or it's his fault. That's just the way it is. That's just how it goes. Whether he did it or not, it doesn't matter. He didn't implement the proper training. They didn't know. Whatever happened, it falls back on him. That's part of being a leader. That's just part of the risk, part of the responsibility, and part of the magnitude. And why this is saying, as Christ is also the head of the church, there's some responsibility in that. I mean, if, if we're going to slack in our job, things are going to start falling apart. You know what happens when you have bad leadership in a command? You got low morale. Things start to go haywire. Things start to go get sloppy really quickly. Sailors start to slack on their uh, qualifications. Things start to go dink out of whack. Your things start to extend on dates. Thing, just things get hairy because leadership is not functioning the way they should. So why should the subordinates? They lose touch. You lose touch. We have to have something over us. For the man, it's God. For the woman, it's God and the man. It's just the function. It's how it works. And there's no slack on the man in that area either. So, as Christ is also the head of the church, both parties have a responsibility. And as the individual parts in the body of the church, guess what? We should recognize Christ's position and authority. And only then can we ever understand the God-given authority over the wife. I keep, I keep saying that. There's, there's a reason a rooster acts like a rooster and a hen acts like a hen. There really is. I know you may not think so. But if you ever spend any time watching those two, they're very different. <laughs> very different. And I know that a lot of people like to combine them. But if you watch that rooster dance around and always looking around to see what's going on, always trying to protect those hens, and they don't have a care in the world. They're just eating and scratching and having a good time. You know, that's how it's really supposed to be. That's really how it's supposed to be. God designed the human race to have a head to look out for, to protect, to protect the soul, protect the body, protect them while they're in their element. And see, they don't, the hens don't care about what's way over there. That's his job, right? That's his job. That's what he does. He, even though he goes way overboard sometimes, but he does a good job at it, doesn't he? So the husband has to fulfill that role. He has to get in that spot and realize that there is a responsibility. Go, go stare at the rooster. Learn, you might learn something. So, and really what's amazing is that, you, you know, you always have somebody in, that you see or that you know, maybe it was you or me, or somewhere that, um, that ha seem to have no regard for authority. An order goes in one ear and it goes out the other. Which, by the way, is a clear indicator of pride and of arrogance in your soul. But, and it's also an indicator of improper function within the plan of God. And ultimately, I think, unhappiness to a person. So, that's why the best thing a parent can do for a child is model and live out God's plan for their life. That, that's how we can do that. Which means just what this is saying. The man is the head and the wife is subject to him. So um, it's easier to show than teach sometimes. 
It can be. It depends on the, on the children, right? Or the parents, I guess you could say. Um, but the best teacher is hands down a daily walk with the Lord. I cannot teach like that. Come talking from a human perspective. But I know I can focus on my walk with the Lord. That's a natural teacher because you are living. Your life is a teacher. You're teaching because of the what you practice. You're practicing what you preach. Right. So. Because many times I'll be the first one to tell you, we can be pretty inconsistent. To say the least, when it comes to preaching to our kids or to giving advice or to teaching. But guess where we're consistent right here. And they see that they pick up on that and we can maintain that consistency and, and reliability there. So there's a there's there's hope for us. Right. Um, but it all starts in the home and it extend it's extended, I think, in the local church. Hello, prep school. Right. There's a responsibility there. Verse 24. I didn't give you that one. But it says, but as the church is subject to the to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Wow. In everything. Now, here we have our word again, hupotasso. This is the same word. Remember, it started in verse 21. Be subject to everyone. Here it is again. Here it is again. It says, but as the church is subject to Christ. Let me remind you what it means to place or rank under, to subject to, referring to God's arrangement of mankind and submitting to that arrangement. So there's a comparison being made here between our submission, the church, to Christ and the wife's submission to the husband. And this word in, is in the present tense, which is what? Continuous action. See how the present tense is telling us a lifestyle? This isn't something I pick up on Saturday and say, I'm going to be this. It's present, continuous. This is something that this is a lifestyle. This is a habit. This is something that we train and train and train. We're so adept in that we, we do it. And we don't even think about it. We can do it. So, and it also means that if you don't think you are capable of submitting to a person in God, a God-given position, authority, as the husband, I'll say it again, you probably shouldn't get married to him. Passive voice is saying that the subject receives the action of the submitting. Well, we have the church is a subject in this sentence. And we have the wife. We are receiving the subjection. These two subjects, the church and the wife, are receiving the attitude of subjection. And the only way we can have any kind of true and genuine humility is by receiving it from God. Not going to receive it from the husband. Not going to receive it from any outsource of that. But only from the word of God. That's it. Only comes from an understanding of who he is and what he wants from us. And then, of course, there's two words that I'm sure you didn't want to see. It says in everything. Now, I've seen a lot of different people put that in a different way or their understanding of it. But the way I see it is in everything. That is not outside of the realm of Scripture. In everything, you know, there, there's always a policy. There's always a way of thinking when it comes to kids, when it comes to living, when it comes to how things should be done. And I know that we all have. Uh, and there's also things that should be left alone. You know, wives know how to do things better than the husbands. In many areas. And there's things that we don't need to invest time in, 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 in po implementing policy. You remember, that's part of the freedom that the rooster allows the hens. He allows them 
to do their job. And guess what? Because of that, he's allowing them the freedom to function in their role and they're happy. See, when you're overbearing, when you're implementing policy where we shouldn't be implementing policy, we're out of bounds. The captain doesn't come down to the birthing to talk to the recruits about sweeping the floor. That's not his role, right? It's just not his role. There's always a chain of command. So the wives have a really big responsibility. And the only way this is going to be accomplished is with unconditional love. That is absolutely it. That is it. And you're not going to get that from the husband. You're going to get it from your relationship with the Lord. Because we can see what the next verse says. Verse 25. Husbands. Here we are on the husbands. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And guess what the verse that I immediately thought of when I thought of this. But God showed his love. Actually, I thought of 1 John 4, 19 as well. We love because he loved us first. It's the man's responsibility for a response. It's the man's responsibility for an environment. It's a man's responsibility to lead. It's a man's responsibility to love first. You know how many men are expecting something in return before they can love? Nine out of 10. That's not what Jesus Christ did. That's not what the man does. That's not what we do. We love because we love Christ. We love because it's coming from a genuine motivation because that's what is glorifying to God. And it works the same way with the woman. You can unconditionally love the man, not because of what he does or what he doesn't have or what he doesn't do, because you love Christ. And see, there's that impersonal aspect coming in. Because once that personal love, go, he's doing something wrong, God's divine unconditional love comes in there and fills the gap. Then it's not dependent on your husband. It's dependent on what's inside of you. What's in your soul. And that's that love that we all need to have so we can make these relationships last. Because we all depend on the Lord. That's why we, they can be a beautiful thing. Thank God, right? If these relationships depended on us, man, we'd be torn apart. And that's what we see. They're torn apart all the time because people don't rely on the Lord in their relationships or the Holy Spirit. So with that being said, we'll pick up with the man, the husband's love. And I mentioned that earlier. There was three verses for the woman. There's nine for the man. So we got we're going to get hammered. But that's good. Right. That's the by design. That's how it's supposed to be. Responsibility. And the head, with the head comes great responsibility. So, with that being said, let's pray. Dear Father, we are thankful for Jesus Christ. We know that uh, we wouldn't have the opportunity to learn. We wouldn't have the capability to learn. We wouldn't have the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit reborn. We've been reborn because of Jesus Christ on the cross, because of salvation. We were lost in sin. We're born into sin and you provided a way to get out of that death and sin out of the slave slave market of sin. We thank you for Jesus Christ, because with his death on the cross, he paid the penalty of every sin of mankind. And you made that penalty available that could be applied to us, not by paying it, but just by believing in what. Jesus Christ did by him dying for our sins. And we're so grateful for that. Your, your word says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's a lot of work that went involved in that cross and you made it free. So we are grateful that your grace is, is, is there for us. We thank you for these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.